Hey guys, Bob here. Welcome back to The Docket, presented by Defense Diaries. So this week on The Docket, we are covering the stunning news out of Delphi, Indiana. Yes, I realize that we're a little bit late on this, but I have to be honest, we were trying to push back this episode of The Docket until after November 22nd, because it was on that date that the first substantive motion in the case was heard. Finally, after five and a half long years, then an arrest has been made for the murders of Abby Williams and Libby German. Now, there's a lot of moving parts, so let's waste no time and let's dig in. So I'm going to give you a brief little primer on what's been going on, even though I'm going to assume that you know most of this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. So on October 26 of 2022, a man named Richard Allen was taken into custody and was held over until the 28th. Now, law enforcement did not have a press conference to announce it, but with the massive interest in this case in the true crime community and beyond, it was the worst kept secret on the planet that Allen had been taken into custody in relation to the murders of Abby and Libby. Now, I personally consider the most reliable source outside of law enforcement to be Kelsey German, Liberty's sister, on Twitter. She had tweeted on the 27th that today is the day, until it is the day, and that day will come. So that was kind of floating out there when Alan was taken into custody. So most of the world assumed that Alan was the guy. Now, Alan had been a resident of Delphi since 2006. And the home that he owns is not far from where the bodies of Abby and Libby were located. He worked as a pharmacy tech at a local CVS. Now, his criminal history shows nothing other than traffic tickets. So he is not a guy that would have been on the cop's radar immediately. But there's a little more to that, but we'll get to it later. So on October 28th, Alan was brought in front of the judge and he was arraigned. Arraignment is when the judge formally advises the defendant just exactly with what he's being charged and the potential penalties that come along with those charges. So Alan was informed that he was being charged with two counts of murder connecting to the slayings of Abigail and Liberty. After he was arraigned, he was asked whether he wanted to enter a plea of guilty or not guilty. Alan pled not guilty to both counts. Now, that is absolutely standard fare, and a vast majority of defendants plead not guilty after being arraigned. Just because a defendant pleads not guilty initially does not mean that they can't enter a guilty plea down the road. And the fact of the matter is that that's exactly what a vast majority of criminal defendants do. What also went down on this date is that Judge Benjamin Diener set two separate court dates. The first being January 13th, 2023 for a pretrial conference. Now that's kind of a housekeeping hearing, basically where the defense and the state come in and they advise the judge where they're at in the discovery process. And when I say discovery process, I'm talking about the exchange of evidence between the state and the defense. Typically, it's the state that tenders a large discovery package to the defense containing police reports, lab reports, witness interviews, etc. These items have to be turned over, and the responsibility to tender evidence continues all the way up until trial. And that doesn't just apply to the state. It applies to the defense as well. They call it reciprocal discovery. But in a situation where the state fails to turn over evidence and it turns out to be exculpatory or helpful for the defendant, this can amount to what is called a Brady violation. Now, the biggest problem with sniffing out a Brady violation is that the trial attorney for the defendant can't miss what he doesn't know exists. More often than not, Brady material is almost always discovered after someone is convicted, usually by the appellate attorneys. Now, I won't drag you into that rabbit hole right now, but someday I will, and you've been warned. So what also goes down at the pretrial conference is that the judge will also set dates for any potential pretrial motions that may be filed by either of the parties. Now, if you listen to the main pod, then you know that it is these pretrial motions where the real war is waged. It's during these motions that the lawyers argue about what should and shouldn't be admissible at trial, meaning what the jury will get to hear. And I'm not kidding. They don't show these hearings enough on law and crime or court TV, but they should because it's where most cases are won or lost. Now, Judge Diener also set the matter for trial for March 20th of 2023. 
So I'm going to let you know right now, so you're not all pissed off when that date gets continued, because it will, I guarantee it. The only way that that case goes on March 20th of 2023 is if Richard Allen does a speedy trial demand. In Indiana, that means that the case must go to trial within 180 days from October 28th of 2022 when he was arraigned. If they don't, unless there is some viable argument by the state as to why they didn't go to trial, the judge is going to dismiss the case. Yeah, that's right. Dismiss the case. Now, I have not seen that Alan has made a speedy demand as of yet, and I'm assuming that he isn't going to. That trial date is getting continued because, as they say, the wheels of justice turn slowly. And in a case like this, with a double homicide and five-plus years of investigation, I won't be surprised if this case takes at least two years before it goes to trial, if not longer. I know that you don't want to hear that, but them's the facts. So aside from Alan being arrested and charged with two counts of murder, the next biggest issue is that at the request of the prosecutor, the judge has sealed the probable cause affidavit and the charging documents. What are those, Bob? Well, I'm glad you asked. Now, this isn't quite meaty enough for a, it's your favorite time, it's my favorite time, but those are coming. We promise, as we close in on trial in season two, Tunnel Vision. So with respect to the charging documents in this particular matter, what they would do is they would list exactly what Alan has been charged with and under what section of the murder statue he's being charged because there are multiple different ways that you can be charged with murder. And it would also include any other crimes that he might be charged with in connection with the murders. But the most stunning event to come out of that first court date on the 28th is the fact that the judge sealed the documents, in particular, the probable cause affidavit. Now, why do we care about the probable cause affidavit? Well, because they're sworn statements by one or more cops wherein they're telling the judge exactly what they have in terms of evidence to establish probable cause that Richard Allen should be arrested. Essentially what they are is it lays out the entire theory of the state's case, where it stands right now. Now, as we've told you in Defense Diaries, the investigation will continue sometimes all the way up to trial, actually more often than not all the way up to trial. So there will be new evidence that comes in. But at this juncture, they had to have at least enough to get in front of a judge to say, Your Honor, this is what we have. This is what we believe that Richard Allen did. We're asking for you to issue an arrest warrant. Now, typically, once the judge actually issues that arrest warrant, the probable cause affidavit is open to the public. It is right there for everyone to view. So that's what makes this so unusual. And I've spoken to a couple of my friends that are attorneys in Indiana, and this does not happen. This is not normal fare for Indiana. This is incredibly rare. So the state is arguing, and they may be exactly right. It's hard to know in this particular situation that they are worried that if the probable cause affidavit comes out because of the massive high publicity nature of this case, that it might compromise the investigation and or could expose potential witnesses to threats or worse, to their health and safety. Judge Diener agreed, and at that point, the documents were sealed. So that's where that stood going into the date of November 22nd. Now, before we get to the 22nd, on October 31st, law enforcement finally had the press conference where they announced that Richard Allen had been arrested, that he'd been charged with two counts of murder. Now, it was during this press conference where they announced, they being the Indiana State Police, that it was still an open investigation and that they were going to be leaving the tip line open. Now, this immediately caused speculation that there's going to be additional arrests made in the case. Now, whether or not that's true, again, it's complete speculation, which is a direct result from the fact that the documents are sealed. Now, I know that the families of Libby and Abby have heard what law enforcement has said about if we unseal the documents, that they're concerned about a compromise in the investigation. So if you're the family and you're hearing this come from law enforcement, you, of course, are going to be saying, we don't want that to happen. Please don't unseal the documents. The reality is, is a very high bar for the judge to not unseal them because trials are public. And they're public because it allows us, as citizens, to hold people accountable for their actions. There has to be transparency. So quite frankly, it's going to be tough for them to keep them sealed. So I have to be honest, I don't really appreciate law enforcement feeding information that isn't exactly 
accurate to Libby and Abby's families, knowing damn well that the families are going to then turn around and say, hey, we don't want the documents unsealed because it's going to compromise the investigation. If I was being told that and I was the family and I didn't know any better, I'd be doing the exact same thing. And it's an unusual circumstance because typically it's the defendant that doesn't want documents unsealed because once those are unsealed, that is when the press runs wild and they start convicting your client in the press. So this is a very odd situation. Typically, by the time the state goes to the judge, gets the arrest warrant, the arrest is made, and the defendant is arraigned, that's fair game. It's out there because they have enough evidence to have gotten to the point that they're at. So as you can imagine, the press has been going nuts. There have been tons and tons of record requests made. And what that did is it triggered an Indiana statute that requires that a hearing be held, which is that hearing that happened on November 22nd. And the focus of that hearing is going to be whether or not the document should remain sealed. Now, before we get to the 22nd of November court date, a couple other things went down since Allen was arrested. One of them being that Judge Diener, the original judge, the one who sealed the documents, filed a petition to recuse himself from the case or remove himself from the case, citing fear for his own safety and the, quote, bloodlust, end quote, of the public as the reasons why he wouldn't be able to oversee this case. As a result, the Indiana Supreme Court appointed a special judge from a different county, Allen County to be exact, to preside over the case. So Judge Fran Gull will be hearing the arguments on the 22nd of November, and it will be her decision and her decision alone as to whether or not the documents will remain sealed. Hey, beautiful humans, Bob here. I wanted to talk to you for a minute about a sponsor that we absolutely love, and that sponsor is Shopify. And why do we love Shopify? Well, because they give small business owners and entrepreneurs the ability to be able to get their incredible products out to market with their own virtual storefronts and with only a minimal amount of effort. And then Shopify helps them become big businesses. Look, I'm dead serious here. Shopify has absolutely changed the game. As hundreds of thousands of businesses that may have never had the opportunity to get their products out to the public are now completely in the game. Brands like Death Wish Coffee, Magic Spoon Cereal, Gymshark, all sell their amazing products through Shopify. And it's not just the small growing businesses that sell through Shopify. It's the big dogs too, like Heinz and Mattel. But what else separates Shopify from everyone else that helps small businesses turn into big businesses? Well, how about because it's the number one checkout experience on the planet? Or maybe it's ShopPay, which boosts conversions up to 50%. That means that less carts go abandoned and way, way more sales are happening. This is the bottom line. The businesses out there that sell more, quite simply, sell on Shopify. So upgrade your business and get the same checkout that Gymshark, Death Wish Coffee, Magic Spoon, Heinz, and Mattel use. So sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash dd. Again, go to shopify.com slash dd to upgrade your selling today. That's shopify.com slash dd. I can tell you this, as soon as our t-shirts and all our merch is ready, there's only one place on the planet where Defense Diaries is going to be selling their goods, and that, my friends, is Shopify. Now, getting back to the question of to seal or to unseal, interestingly, Doug Carter, who is the superintendent with the Indiana State Police, told Hammer and Nigel of WIBC Radio that he does not believe that releasing the documents would jeopardize the case and that he believes that if the documents are unsealed, that it will answer all of the questions that people have. So you've got the superintendent of the Indiana State Police saying one thing, and you've got the lead investigator saying another, which is that if we unseal it, it's going to be compromising the investigation. It's gotta be gut-wrenching for the family. I don't know why they can't get their heads together and just figure out what the best approach to handle this is. I know that everyone is terrified about screwing this case up, I think with this overmanagement, that that might be exactly what they're doing. That is a definite concern of mine. Now, from a law enforcement perspective and an investigation standpoint, oftentimes the reason law enforcement does not disclose the details of the evidence that they have or of the ongoing investigation 
is because that they want a situation to exist where there are details that only the killer and law enforcement would know. Because if these facts were leaked to the public, that advantage of potentially knowing that they have the right suspect because the suspect knew something that only the killer would know would vanish. So I really can see both sides of the argument. And typically as a criminal defense attorney, I want full transparency from the government. Not because I don't trust them, but because I don't trust them. But I also don't want to see the investigation compromised. I want to see justice for Libby and Abby. That is 100%. But if Alan is the only guy that they are arresting, well, he's in custody. And a top cop is saying that he doesn't believe unsealing the documents will jeopardize the case. So I think at that point, I'm leaning towards unsealing the documents. And I'll get to exactly why in a few minutes. But that's not all that went down. So at the initial hearing on the 28th of October, Allen had told the judge that he was going to try to hire a private counsel. After he was arrested, his wife started receiving death threats and had to quit her job. And Allen, well, he's not going to be employed, maybe ever again. So after realizing that there was no way in hell he could afford a decent attorney, he wrote a letter to the judge stating that he was at the mercy of the court for it to appoint him a lawyer. Well, the reality is the Fifth and Sixth Amendment and Gideon versus Wainwright guarantee that he'll have counsel, so he didn't need to beg. But poof, like magic, Bradley Rossi and Anthony Baldwin were appointed to represent him. Now, neither of these guys are public defenders, and both are private attorneys who were appointed, and they will be paid by the county to defend Allen. So if you're wondering why not a public defender, well, the answer is because this is a very, very small county. And they may have only one public defender. They have all the other cases that have to be handled. And additionally, this is going to be a death penalty case, which means that the attorney handling the matter has to be certified to handle a death penalty case. So what they did is they went and found two competent attorneys from around the surrounding area, and they were appointed. And I'm thrilled about that because we want competent attorneys on both sides of this case. We do not want this to be fraught with bad lawyering. Because bad lawyering equals appellate issues. Appellate issues equals it getting sent back to be retried. No one wants that to happen. Let's get it right the first time. Let's get good lawyers in there to try this case and see where it lands. So after Alan got his attorneys appointed, there was another bit of breaking news that came out. And frankly, like anything, it's always hard to tell what's fact and what's speculation. But this recent story by Wish TV is reporting that an unnamed source, and I hate those, has stated that Alan, on the date that the girls went missing of February 13th of 2017, had gone to a state conservation officer and told that officer that he was in the area of High Bridge on the 13th at around the time that the girls went missing, but that he didn't see the girls. Now, that's kind of a mind-blowing story. And what's most disturbing about this particular story is that apparently this sheet of paper, this statement by Allen, got buried and was forgotten about until recently when the Indiana State Police became frustrated with how the Delphi investigation was going and they sent a group of investigators over to relook at the files related to the case. Now, I have to believe that this information will be included within the facts of the probable cause affidavit because it puts Allen, by his own admission, at or around the bridge the day that Abby and Libby went missing. Now, another story that broke, and this came from a police source, which is a little bit better than an unnamed source, but still not great. That confirmed that a recent five-week search of the Wabash River in Peru, Indiana, and was in fact related to the Delphi investigation. It was initiated by none other than Keegan Klein, aka Anthony Schatz, who apparently told police that they would find a cell phone and a weapon in the river. Of course, after five weeks of searching and dragging the river, nothing was recovered. Now, it is certainly not beyond the scope of reason that Klein was somehow involved in some capacity with the murders. But my gut is telling me that if he was, it was not that he was physically at the scene, but that he may have been the one who got the girls to go to the bridge on that awful day. He, by his own admission, said that he was communicating with Libby online. And... It's possible that, in fact, it was Klein that coordinated between himself and Alan for Alan to be there at the time that the girls were supposed to be meeting Anthony Schatz. 
look, that is conspiracy. If that's what happened, he's 100% complicit in the murders of both the girls. So at this point, we're just speculating now. And that's what we've been doing for five and a half years, which brings us to November 22nd of 2022. Let's find out what happened in court that day. So I hopped in the car at about five in the morning and made the two and a half hour drive to Delphi in order to see what was going to happen firsthand. Now, the night before the hearing, I became aware that defense counsel had filed a motion to modify the conditions of bond, whereby they are seeking that there is a bond actually set because Alan is currently on a no bond. And they were asking the court to release Alan on his own recognizance, meaning he didn't have to post any money. So that was also going to be heard the same day. So we had two big motions going down as I'm driving. Now, just to give you an idea, and, and look, I want nothing more than to see justice for Abby and Libby. But the state has a very high burden to meet in order to keep the documents sealed. They must show that extraordinary circumstances exist where a court record that should otherwise be made available to the public is sealed. And it's Indiana's Access to Court Records Rule 6, which delineates exactly what the state must show by clear and convincing evidence in order to have any shot at keeping the record sealed. Now, don't get me wrong, this is not an all-or-nothing proposition for the state. They only have to show one of these factors in order for the judge to be able to rule that the documents can remain sealed. So this is what they are. One, that the public interest will be substantially served by prohibiting access. Two, that access or dissemination of the court record will create a significant risk of substantial harm to the requester, other persons, or the general public. And last but not least, a substantial prejudicial effect to the ongoing proceedings cannot be avoided without prohibiting access. Now, out of those three factors, it's numbers two and three that I believe the state has the best chance of showing the judge by clear and convincing evidence that they apply. With number two, if the state does in fact have witnesses that they believe that there is a significant risk of substantial harm to those witnesses, they might be able to get it done. Now, if they were to use factor three, it seems as if they would have to put on their defense attorney's shoes because that is typically the argument that a defense attorney makes, that all this kind of publicity because of the unsealing of the records is going to make it impossible for Richard Allen to get a fair trial. So it's an unusual position for the state to be in, but it's an argument they may have to make. Now, if the state is able to meet one of those factors, then the court must use the least restrictive means and duration when prohibiting access. So what that means is even if the court finds that some of the information contained within the probable cause affidavit should remain sealed, the court is obligated to release a redacted version of the same document to the public. Now, if I'm wearing my lawyer hat, I'm saying you have to unseal the documents. However, if I'm wearing my citizen hat, I can see some valid arguments as to why they may want to keep the document sealed. I mean, from the family side of things, if they're hearing from law enforcement that they are concerned that if the information is released, that it would compromise the investigation, then their worry and consternation is valid and warranted. I will say this, however, in general, by the time the state gets in front of a judge to request that an arrest warrant be issued and provides that judge with the PC for the arrest, that typically means that the state believes that they already have enough strong evidence for the arrest meaning that they have substantial evidence in hand. So in this situation with Richard Allen, when the judge issued the warrant, all they had to go by was that affidavit. And if that affidavit is truthful and it is a sworn affidavit, it has to be assumed by us, the public, that they in fact actually have the evidence that they talk about in the affidavit, whether it be DNA, prints, phone data, or witnesses. And releasing the PC affidavit publicly will do nothing to harm that evidence. It's in hand. It's either in a storage locker or an evidence locker or in a state lab. So that leaves me with the only exception being that of a material witness that they believe that they need to protect, who theoretically could be gotten to in order to stop them from testifying. But that is an easy remedy. They simply redact the name or the names in the affidavit before it's released to the public. And again, remember, we have Doug Carter, the superintendent of the Indiana State Police, going on record stating that he does not believe that releasing the information will jeopardize the investigation. However, at the hearing on the 22nd, the prosecutor, Nick McLeland, provided the judge with an affidavit from the lead investigator in the case, 
who agrees that releasing the information could be damaging, if not fatal, to certain aspects of the investigation. The problem with that is that while nobody wants that to happen, the fact of the matter is that without more, more information, them's just words, nothing more. Scary words, but words without any real substance behind them. McLean also argued the worst kept secret out there, which is that there are very likely others involved with the crime. Now, you didn't have to be a psychic to know that when Alan was arrested and the top cops said that they were leaving the tip line open and the investigation was still ongoing, that there was a high likelihood that they were still looking at other suspects. So in essence, McLean was only confirming what we all thought was the case anyway. Now, the defense was in the unusual, bizarro world position of having to argue that the documents be unsealed. And why is that so strange? Well, because like I said earlier, I don't want all the information that the state has getting out to the press and to the public at large, because that is how citizens and potential jurors form a bias and come into court already thinking that my guy is guilty. So that is not what I want ever. So this is a very, very unusual circumstance for the defense to be arguing in favor of having the documents unsealed. Now, the defense attorneys do have a copy of the probable cause affidavit, and they've obviously reviewed it, and they are stating that the state has the wrong guy. They're so confident in their client's innocence that they are using that as the basis for the argument to unseal the documents. And again, that is typically not the case. So you have to take this puffery with a grain of salt, because one thing is for certain, they may have read the state's theory of the case, but they most definitely have not seen the evidence. Anthony Baldwin, one of Allen's attorneys, claimed that the fact that there may be others involved was news to them. Come on, man. No, it's not. You knew, just like the rest of us. Look, y'all know, no one advocates more for defense attorneys than I do. But Baldwin's statements to the press after that hearing are baseless at this point. Now, Judge Frangull listened and ultimately advised everyone that she was going to take the issue under advisement, meaning that she was going to have a think on it. And she gave herself no deadline by when she has to rule. Now, considering that she was given a redacted copy of the probable cause affidavit at that hearing, and from what I hear that the redactions were witnesses' names, I believe that she will unseal the document sometime after the new year, before the February 17th court date for the bond, and what will ultimately be made available to the public will be a redacted version of the probable cause affidavit that does not include the witnesses' names. Now, the other thing that I just brought up is that bond hearing, which is set for February 17th, and I will do everything in my power to be in that courtroom for that argument. Now, Allen's attorney Baldwin filed that motion at the 11th hour. It was a bare bones, two page motion that basically just laid out the fact that because it's a murder case, the burden that's usually with the defense shifts to the state and they have to show the judge information at a hearing from which the judge can make their own independent determination whether there is admissible evidence against the defendant that adds up to a strong or evident proof of guilt. Now, that is no small task. The prosecutor just can't come in and say, oh, well, we have this, this, and this. They have to provide actual proof to the judge in order to have Allen remain in jail during the pendency of the trial with no bond. And so this is where it gets a little tricky. So what does it mean since the affidavit is sealed? Well, either that it must be unsealed because the state must argue those facts in order to keep Allen in jail up till trial. Or I suppose it's possible that the judge hears the argument in a closed courtroom, but that seems completely unreasonable and even more so unconstitutional. I cannot see that happening. But there has been a lot of unusual things that have gone on with this case since the jump. So at the end of the day, Judge Gull set the bond motion for hearing on February 17th of 2023, which is an absolutely insane length of time for a bail hearing to be put out. Those typically happen within a week if it's a motion to modify the conditions of bond. To be honest, if I was Allen's attorney, I'd be filing a writ of habeas corpus to get my client in front of the judge long before the February 17th date because that is simply an unreasonable, no, outrageous amount of time to go before a man who is presumed innocent can have his day in court to argue whether the conditions of his bond can be modified. So I digress, but 
I just spent an hour discussing how unreal this bond motion being sent out to February of 23 is with Brett of the Prosecutor's Podcast on their side pod, Legal Briefs, which will be available on our Patreon momentarily. So that's what we have on Delphi so far. So keep an eye on our TikTok at Defense Diaries Podcast and our Twitter at Defense underscore Diaries for daily updates. And just keep in mind, I'm going to be following this trial. I'm going to be trying to get into that courthouse for every court date that happens preceding trial. And I'll try to get in a trial, but I think that that's going to be a lottery situation. It's a small courthouse, it's a small courtroom. And I think that there's a lot of people that are going to want to be in there. So it'll be tough, but I'm going to give it a shot. So I can tell you right now on the next docket, we will be covering the tragic events that have taken place in Moscow, Idaho, where the four college students were brutally murdered while they slept. I have to tell you, I'm a bit obsessed with that case and the seeming incompetence of law enforcement up there. So it'll be an interesting one. Talk to you later. When you sign up at Work Money, you could win $50,000. With the average renter paying around $2,100 per month, that means you can have rent covered for a whole year and more. So you can be more. And when you're more, that means you get more. And more. Ooh, but not so much of that. Sign up at Work Money. Get money saving tips. Skip the rent. Get more rich. Sign up at workmoney.org slash more rich contest for your chance to win $50,000.